Good evening. Good evening, everyone. I'm Harold Holzer, director of the Roosevelt House, and it's a pleasure to welcome our audience and our participants, particularly Hunter's own Margaret Chin, for tonight's screening and discussion. Um, in a moment, you will meet um, people who are or should be familiar to you, Rick Burns, um, who, with his brother Ken, created uh, the classic series, The Civil War, on PBS, and working on his own classics, uh, created New York, um, Eugene O'Neill, and many other extraordinary films. We are so honored to have him here with Lin Shin Yu, his collaborator of many years standing. Um, and we're happy that, if I'm allowed to say, this is Rick Burns' first visit to Roosevelt House, which is a great landmark. As many of you know who come here often, uh, the space we occupy is of such inspiration to us on a daily basis because this was Franklin Roosevelt's New York City home and Eleanor's New York City home for 25 years. Um, and it was the incubator not only for the New Deal, but we think for Eleanor's commitment to human rights on a global scale. Even if it was inspired because her mother-in-law criticized so much of what she did in the home that she couldn't wait to get out of it. That's sort of a shorthand version of what, what happened. But um, it is true that her mother-in-law, who occupied half the house, built the house as a gift, later told her she was such a bad housekeeper, such a miserable mother, uh, such a terrible and hopeless cook, that she might as well go to, with her to the East Side Settlement House and devote herself to others, which she did. Uh, and it was the beginning of a career in humanitarianism that is um, extraordinary, of course. Um, we acknowledge here um, FDR's presence. It was here that he recovered from polio. It was here that he determined to pursue a public career and not a career as sort of a perpetual invalid as his mother wanted him to do. And it was from this house that he launched his campaigns for governor and president, and as I mentioned, um, led the transition. I don't often say it, but this was sort of the Trump Tower of 1932-33. This is where uh, Franklin... <laughs> We're just talking um, architecturally here. <laughs> this is where he managed the transition, and this is where uh, three floors above where ideas like Social Security and the Works Progress Administration and the N uh, all, I almost said the NRA, they were all incubated and discussed and germinated. Um, we know as we honestly examine the New Deal and the Roosevelt era that it didn't help all Americans. Um, it's hard to believe that concessions were made in creating the New Deal that excluded people of color from some of the early benefits, including Social Security, because domestic workers were excluded from the original plan. Um, we acknowledge as well, and um, it's important in terms of framing tonight's event, that there were people not only excluded from the New Deal, but excluded from America itself, um, even in an era when people were yearning to breathe free as the yoke of fascism expanded in Europe and in Asia. Um, and we know that the Chinese Exclusion Act, which tonight's film explores, made it impossible for refugees from China to even dream about becoming Americans in the 1930s and 40s. And they were that era's version of the dreamers that we hear about so often today. Well, FDR is the one who did something to correct the inequity. He pushed for and proudly signed the game-changing legislation that vanquished the Chinese Exclusion Act. It was Roosevelt who finally allowed this country to lift up its lamp to usher in more people more fairly into America. Ever the brilliant politician, he made it uh, he, his appeal was not to humanitarianism. It was to supporting 
the Chinese allies in the fight against the Japanese. That's how he framed the legislation. Um, as he put it, Chinese resistance does not depend on guns and planes uh, alone. It is based on the spirit of her people and her faith in her allies. So um, the argument worked, whatever it took. Um, as usual, it was Eleanor who had her own humanitarian take on this reform, just as she pushed Franklin on the New Deal and on inclusion, she pushed him a bit on this issue too. And she expressed it succinctly in one of her My Day columns. Um, she said that the world could never enjoy a permanent peace when peoples of one race approach those of other races in a spirit of contempt. Eleanor had contempt only for war and not for any people at any time. So tonight, as we contemplate the exclusion uh, that tarnished the American dream for so long, we're thankful that we can also celebrate the inclusion that the Roosevelts helped usher in during World War II. Uh, so we're going to see um, an extended highlight reel from this film that will be broadcast in May. And you will also meet the people responsible for it and those who are here to help us analyze the history and the film. And now it's a pleasure to introduce, to frame the film, Lin Shin Yu and my friend Rick Burks. Um, just want to very quickly thank the Roosevelt House, you know, Hunter College, um, for inviting us here. We're so, it's, it's a great honor to be here in this historical house. And um, we had, um, the film got started, our partners were at the New York Historical Society. A number of years ago, we always felt that this film was important uh, story to tell, but as development of the project was delayed, we increasingly felt day to day how important and how resonant this history is to us today, to not just Chinese Americans, but, but to all, the, all Americans. And so we're so pleased and also wanted to thank our partners, uh, Center for Asian American Media, Media, Center for Asia. Yeah. 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 You got it. Who, <laughs> who is uh, spearheading the outreach for our film and made tonight possible? And, we're, and um, Rick will say a little bit about what we're showing tonight. Let me just uh, echo what Li Shen said. It's really wonderful to be here and kind of shivery for me personally to be here, having never been here before. It kind of, you can't walk through those doors or go up to the library without feeling a strong sense of contact with a very, very historic place and time in American history. So we're really particularly pleased and, and grateful, Margaret Harold, for having been invited to come and showcase some of the film. I just wanted to say briefly that um, we, the film in its entirety is two hours and 40 minutes. Um, it would have been my first wish that you be here for two hours and 40 minutes, watch the whole thing, but apparently that was logistically not gonna be possible. Um, it, it's not even possible for PBS to do that, so they're broadcasting a 112-minute, nearly two-hour version of it. Um, what you're going to see here is 35 minutes. Um, and the, you know, I, I won't try to pantomime all the things that you're not going to see, um, but I do want to sort of say a thing or two um, about what you will see so that you understand some of the things that aren't going to be appropriately contextualized in, this, in these three sections that are, we're going to show you. The introduction, which will, you know, introduces itself, sort of sets the scene in 10 or 12 minutes. Um, and then it skips very dramatically over about an hour of material and lands um, in the 1870s as the really, what had begun in, the, in California um, after the gold rush, um, the, ant, the movement to exclude Chinese now picks up national traction in the wake of a number of things that have happened during parts of the film you aren't going to see. Because the film goes from 1776 all the way down to 2012 in its scope because we see that you can't really understand how this happened without looking at it in the broad context of American history. 
of critical importance um, to the nationalization of the exclusion movement were two things which were Lincoln era um, uh, initiatives. One was the Transcontinental Railroad, which many people called the Iron Road to China, um, and was very much part of a desire to enhance and accelerate the China trade. Um, as part of that movement as well, um, at one time Massachusetts congressman named Anson Burlingame was sent by Lincoln in 1861 to become the first American ambassador to Beijing to try to heal relationships which had been sorely strained during, the, during and after the Opium Wars um, and also to encourage what he was very effective at doing, a free flow of people and things between the two countries. And this culminated in 1868, three years after the Civil War, in the Burlingame Treaty, um, when, it was a, when that treaty negotiated uh, something which is entirely non-exclusive. If you were, you know, Chinese people could come here, Americans could go there, there was a kind of a NAFTA agreement between China and the United States. So when you hear the Burlingame Treaty, mentioned, for those of you who don't know what it is, that's what it's, that's what it's being referred to. And it was, the, it was a bone in the craw of the exclusionists because it seemed to make impossible what, of course, then became the case. The second part of the film, the second part you're going to be seeing is the sort of the run-up to exclusion itself um, in 1882, how it came about, the series of legislation that it anticipated it, um, and then the actual enactment of it sort of across 1881, 1882. Then the film will skip after that, and the resistance to it, which was considerable, and it's a crucial part of the story, so you're not going to hear that, um, the way in which, uh, you know, landmark law in the United States was made as Chinese pursued, you know, um, redemption in, in the courts, which they couldn't get at the ballot because they couldn't become citizens, um, and it's not too much to say that major pieces of the le legal architecture of the United States are the result of the proactive work that Chinese did to resist exclusion, to refuse to be excluded um, using the tools they could. Um, the third and final scene you'll see sort of picks up um, after FDR initiates the repeal in 1843. I do want to say, Harold, I know you know this, that when the Chinese were allowed to come, they were given the door prize amount um, in the quota system that was still obtaining. 105 Chinese people a year could come. Um, so it was, they could now become citizens, crucial. It lifted the stigma of being the only people um, who were by name and race and nationality excluded. But it was a process that began in 1943 and really sort of took, not until the Hart Seller Act of 1865 did the thing really change. Um, but during that last section, um, Scott Wong, an extraordinary historian from <coughs> Williams, refers to something called the paper son, a paper son. For anybody who doesn't know what a paper son is, paper son was the, was the achieving of immigrant status in the United States if you were Chinese by fraudulent means essentially by buying or purchasing a fraudulent identity which had been made possible by someone fraudulently claiming they had children back in China who should be allowed to come as their children. Um, this really sort of noble and brave system of fraudulence became known as paper sons and was part of the what's in many ways the most poignant aspect of the Chinese American experience, this complicated set of relations within the Chinese communities in the United States with people that you know, you have this complicated non-blood relationship to they are your relatives, they're not your relatives, you can't really talk about them, and it's one of the sort of the shadowy um, and, and to me very, very moving parts of the story. So those are the three things. I'll stop the attempt to recite the whole film for you. Really look forward to a vigorous discussion afterwards. Thanks. Well, thank you. I'm Margaret Chin. Um, welcome, everybody. Um, thank you for coming. And I have Rick Burns and Li Shi Yu up here. And first of all, I want to say that was a fabulous excerpt. And I'm looking forward to seeing the whole film. And I have to say, as an academic, to see something about one particular Chinese Exclusion Act on film come to life and being able to explain and tell the story articulately to the general public is an excellent thing to do. I mean, as an academic, I worry that I do my research and it gets stuck in some draw and nobody ever sees it, right? But you as filmmakers are fabulous at doing this. So I congratulate you on doing this film and I'm sure it'll have a huge impact. 
Um, so thank you for doing that. Um, and because of that, I actually wanted, um, um, I actually have like three kind of categories of questions, but I might just ask one or two because we just ran over a little bit. But one is about filmmaking, and the other is about the kinds of impact that you see that this film might have. And of course, the third um, subject area is on the content of the film. So maybe I'll ask you the first one about filmmaking first. Like, how do you choose what to put in a film that tells a story about a particular act? What were the kinds of things that come into your mind in making a film? Because I don't think we get to hear about the process so much, you know, at an academic institution, but it'd be nice to know a little bit about it. You know, I think one thing I would say is that, I mean, this is a story preeminently about memory and forgetting. Um, and so at a meta level is one of those stories that really says, like, how is it that we choose or end up at certain points um, focusing on certain aspects of our history, the Statue of Liberty, um, and not on other aspects of our history, the exclusion of Chinese. Um, and the Chinese Exclusion Act, which is just completely unknown. It is not part of the lingua franca that most Americans, I mean, to put it mildly, carry around with them. And so the question, I think, for us from the very beginning was to not see this story as a Chinese story or a story about Chinese immigration, although to be sure, that's where the rubber meets the road um, in crucial ways throughout the story, but a story about um, American identity, about how we construct you know, who and what it is to be an American and who gets included. And when you think about it that way, then you realize if you were to start the film in May of 1882, um, first of all, because forgetting has been so much part of this story, you're dealing with something which has no, it, it's like what, first of all, it's happening during the Gilded Age, it's happening during the age where you, which we associate with bring us your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free. So you start with enormous disorientation. But if you look back and put it in the context of a society, a new society, a relatively new society, which is in the process of defining itself in a world that is itself going through what we now glibly call globalization and realize America was a, a product of globalization. Then you have to sort of, it forces you as filmmakers and storytellers to set it back, set the story in deep historical time. You know, in, with the importance of the China trade, which was crucial to the Republic in, in 1783. So we began all, always in the complicated dynamic globally, a dynamic which we always felt very ambivalent about um, as we sought to define who, what would an American be, who is an American. And so we, you know, we really kind of go back to 1776 and bring it down to 2012, as I said in our opening remarks, so that you can feel the sort of surge and pulse of this story across the crumbling of the Qing Dynasty and the opening war, opium wars, and then you know California, the opening of California, the the Mexican War. Um, I mean, these sort of really epochal events in American and world history um, are really part and parcel of how it was that there was a population in South China in 1849 and 1850 when the world word got out and the world rushed in to California, who got in a you know in a politically complicated situation there not at all unconnected with Anglo-American and, and, and French um, political and military engagements through the opening w opium wars and other things, there's a population ready to hop on American ships which happen to be in that harbor and head east to, you know, to, to get in on the gold rush. So that sense of the kind of the way in which this story picks up, you know, in a way that you can just follow, we find, I think, really thrillingly um, from, you know, the earliest years of the Republic, really show that if you wanted to understand, I would say, if you want to understand what America is in one single story, I really can't think of any story that would do better than this, because it does necessarily require you to sort of arc across 250 years of, of experience. Um, so then um, the other thing, the second thing is, you know, this film is so uh, relevant for today especially the politics about immigration, extreme vetting that gets mentioned here, um, labor, you know, fighting for jobs, um, 
just exclusion of any one particular group, like we even saw the Muslim ban last year, to name just a few things. What do you think the impact of this film will be, and how did, I guess, the last year's politics affect your filmmaking, you know, affect what you chose to put in it as well? Um, I don't <clears throat> think when we started to really dig into the story, we knew how important all of these issues were. You know, it's issues were, you know, globalization, labor, immigration, belonging, uh, all were part of what we wanted um, to, to tell in this story in this larger American history context and not um, Chinese Americans, you know, minorities have always been consigned to the margins and, and you know, what is surprisingly, what we discover is like this story is so central and that's where we want to place it. And um, it, the events outside our door didn't really affect what we were doing, but it really just highlight how important, how crucial, and how we need to tell this story correctly because we're still arguing, we're still, you know, questioning, and we're still, um, you know, events in history is is doesn't happen in isolation. So there is this history, and if we don't understand this history, how are we to understand what's going on now? and how should we approach it? Um. I mean, it is a Rorschach of today. And the way, in a sense, you know, all real pieces of history are. So you don't have to draw the parallels. I mean, that's what it, I just find it's an amazing free song that when Erica Lee, you know, this incredible group of historians um, who are, you know, both behind the scenes and in front of the camera for this film, I mean, it's really second to none in my experience. Um, you know, when she kind of wraps it up, how the history of immigration and our ambivalence about it has been part of what has shaped us from the beginning, you already know that by that time. Um, and, you know, today's Chinese are, you know, well, it's sort of, it's really two groups. You know, the evil, predatory, horrific monsters are Muslims, um, Muslim terrorists, and the people who are going to steal your jobs are Mexicans. So, you know, so here in this aspect of American history that's, that is completely submerged, how are you going to understand where the kind of, um, where the entire species of rhetoric and ideology and argument comes from if you don't go to the source and understand the, this is not an immigration story. This is the immigration story. And an American story. And an American story. It, is, it kind of like everything about our attitude towards immigration, immigrants is reflected in and comes spiraling out of this. And so since, you know, we don't today know this story, we do need to know this story. And, you know, I dare say most people would think, if you said, when was it decided that birthright citizenship mm -hmm. was, you know, part of the American uh, vocabulary? You know, I think before we got into this project, I would have naively thought, well, if it's not in the Constitution, is it in the Constitution? Um, it's probably like, you know, Madison and Hamill, it's in the Federalist, somewhere in there. No, Wong Kim Ark, 1898, he's born in San Francisco to Chinese immigrants. He goes home and then they won't let him come back in. And he takes it to the Supreme Court and in 1898, in a decision every law student knows, Wong Kim Ark, it is determined that if you are born in the United States, you're a citizen. So thank you, Wong Kim Ark. I was born in Baltimore. I now know why that means I'm an American. So I mean, you know, when, when non-trivial aspects of American experience, you know, come swarming, and this is just one of myriad in this story, out of it, you know, like, what have we been doing? How could we be so asleep not to have this story front and center in every high school curriculum, every college curriculum? Because, you know, you're not, it's just not knowing some archival quaint story. Mm -hmm. This is like a piece of you which has been anesthetized. So let's wake it up. Exactly. 
And um, I wanted to emphasize too, that I'm glad you brought up Wong Kim Mark, because I think that um, when they said in the film that the Chinese actually um, took, I guess, took whatever they could, and but they couldn't vote, right. but brought everything they could to the judicial system to try to change things and make things better for themselves. They couldn't change immigration so much, but they were able to change civil rights, right? So I wanted you to emphasize a little bit of the content about that. I know that will be in the, uh, the longer film, and I'm so glad you brought up Wong Kim Ark, but what are some of the other um, lawsuits, if you, if you can remember or? Well, um, I mean, this is th the most inspiring thing about having gone through making this film is finding out that Chinese American, even though, you know, <laughs> pushed to the margin of society, again and, and again, just fought back from the very early days. 1852, when the first, um, the third governor of California started to articulate, you know, the Chinese question, Chinese are coolies, Chinese are slave laborers, so, you know, we're a free state, we don't want them. And, you know, Norman Ah Singh, who came for the gold rush, but was a you know, enterprising merchant, opened up a restaurant very soon after, and he has this eloquent, eloquent rebuttal, all based on um, American, American law, rule of law, and understanding probably more than Americans then, at the time, you know, what it means, or what our democracy means. And um, you have Iquo, which is also probably a case that all law students learn about, Iquo protection, you know, it, and it's all based on the 14th Amendment. And I think, you know, we were sort of months before finishing the film, we spoke to our uh, Jack Chen, who's our advisor, and sort of like, well, what is the one word or one sentence this story is about? And without a beat, he said, 14th Amendment, and it is. And Chinese use that over and over to fight for justice. I mean, which is really, I mean, I find, you know, really such an incredible part of the story that in the three civil rights amendments, you know, the 14th, 13th, 14th, and 15th, abolishing slavery, 13th, 15th, extending uh, the vote to black men, you know, the 14th Amendment has the Equal Protection Clause and very much in contradiction to Dred Scott, which had basically said, if you're black, you have no right a white person need respect from 1857, which really was, you know, started the Civil War in effect. There was going to be no compromising after Dred Scott. And to, so in the 14th Amendment, basically it's like a slap in the face to Dred Scott and saying, whoa, whoa, here's what's reality. If you, all persons born in the United States, not all citizens, which of course would be a code word for all white people, all persons born in the United States, have the protection of all the laws and all the guarantees. It's, you know, that, that part of the 14th Amendment, it's like less than 80 words. You know, that became the lifeline for African Americans, for Chinese Americans throughout the 19th and into the 20th I actually century. I think it's all persons, not even born in the United that's States. That's right, all persons, persons, that's right. All, all persons. persons, that's right. right. So it doesn't matter. You know, personhood becomes this inalienable existential quality which has conferred upon it by the Constitution as of 1868 when it passes. And that is like, that was a, that was a radical, crucial um, change. And to see that, how that ramifies across the story. So again, I mean, the 14th Amendment played such a huge role in, you know, Tate v. Hurley in San Francisco, kind of equal access to education where, you know, the door was barred against a young, you know, Chinese American girl. Um, you know, Mamie, Her uh, Mamie Tape, whose parents had come over and made fantastically well and were kind of middle class, living the American dream in California. But when the first public school in San Francisco opened, Spring Valley School, um, she was denied access. And her mother, Mary Tape, went completely apeshit. And she, she, she just went, this will not stand. 
and took it to the California Supreme Court and won. Unfortunately, you know, it was sort of Brown v. Board of Education 100 years ahead of the time. Um, fortunately, the response of the California public school system was to start a separate but equal Chinese school. So the story is complex and knit into American history, but it's just one of those things where it does, as you were saying, Margaret, you know, it is so connected to the warp and woof of American legal and political culture across 60, 70, 80 years. Exactly, exactly. Was there anything personal that you felt a connection to in the movie? And this is the last one I'll ask, and then I'll open it up to the audience so you can think of your questions too now. Well, <clears throat> for me, um, um, the exclusion law was repealed in 43 during the war, as we, we spoke earlier about how, you know, now China is an ally, so we can't really, it was quite embarrassing, and Japanese were using it, you know, as a tool of propaganda. So it was repealed, it was still very limited, um, and it wasn't until 1965 Hard Seller Act that really opened up Im immigration equitably. And, you know, if it wasn't for Hard Seller, I wouldn't be here. It, you know, so, so we, we all have, have um, there is a connection. My mother was a paper daughter, which is not mentioned, right. just paper sons. Right. So there were a lot of paper daughters. And uh, she lived in constant fear of being found out and being the fear of being deported. And I think that that's a, such an important part. For, for Chinese Americans, Asian Americans in general, mm -hmm. we, we are now considered the model minority. But yet, our own his we don't know our own history. And in not knowing that history, we can't we we can't stand up for the, what's going on now with with Muslims and with um, uh, Hispanics and this whole immigration thing. So I, I think that this can be a very important organizing tool, but it needs to be seen by many many people. Okay. And by the way, the Fourteenth Amendment. If you if if you're here, you have so you have the rights. But unless you're criminal, and that's what has kept African Americans um, imprisoned because then they don't get the rights. Hi. Um, first of all, I think it's important not to reify the Fourteenth Amendment, since the Fourteenth Amendment was also used for to justify segregation. So it's not the amendment, it's actually the politics around the interpretation of the amendment that always is important. But, and I was just curious about the um, uh, politics uh, around 1882, uh, particularly because, as, as uh, Harold Holzer mentioned, that this was a, an early wave of migration that was accepted from, from Europe. And so what was the sort of particular political motivations for the 1882 Act, maybe I missed it, I mean I was, but, uh, and also the rate of migration that was actually occurring in the immediate uh, uh, years before the passage of the Act. Well, the, you know, the, the numbers of Chinese coming to the West Coast, specifically to California in the early years, in the 1850s, and they were kind of Johnny come late leads to the gold rush. They didn't get there in any real numbers until 1851, 1852, by which time, you know, a lot of the a lot of the individual mining was being displaced by the hydraulic mining and stuff like that. Um, you know, the numbers were, I, I guess you could call them somewhat large by California standards, um, but were by no means disproportionately large. And in a sense, who cares? I mean, they were coming as Chileans were coming, as the French were coming, as Sonorans were coming, as white and black Americans were coming for the gold rush. You know, the total numbers, when you look at them, are really kind of st quite stark that, you know, between 1850 and the time of the um, institution of the Ex Exclusion Act, 105 to 110,000 Chinese have come into America, which, as Martin Gold, this extraordinary legal uh, lo lawyer and his historian himself, puts it, that's two tenths of one percent of the American population. During which time, like you know, going on four million Irish people are going to come in. 
So you, do, you might well ask, um, what's the deal here? And that's where it does get caught up, this kind of you know, politicians pandering to mainly working class, mainly white Californians in the 1850s and 60s and onward. Now it becomes national politicians pandering to working class, very frequently immigrant white Americans, Irish, German, et cetera, who in circumstances where you have a constant boom and bust, you know, I mean, think about the, the depressions and recessions of the 19th century, you know, 70, 1873, the worst depression of the 19th century, you know, it was like a kind of an economic holocaust um, across the country made worse, it was a nationalized economic disaster. Um, made so by the by the by the new transcontinental railroad, which, which was nationalizing everything and bringing now Chinese workers from the West Coast for the first time to fill the under the labor shortages in Mississippi and Louisiana plantations, filling the labor shortages when strikes take place in North Adams, Massachusetts. The number is always de minimis, but each time they come about, they're picked up by the press and by you know, sort of opportunistic pol politicians who want to, who, who, who conjure up a fear, it began in California and then spread across the country, of a yellow horde of alien people who did not, their nerves were, you know, uh, sort of atrophied below their skin. They were great in number, but a kind of peculiarly androgynous kind of people. The men weren't manly, but there were so many of them. They were going to overwhelm all 2% of 1% of them. Um, you're going to overwhelm the population. And as the Civil War, post-Civil War dynamic um, occurred, which is what we were trying to sort of sketch at least slightly in this, what you had is you had essentially at the core of the deal is um, Southern politicians trade their votes with California politicians and, and other politicians on the, on the West Coast so that as Reconstruction collapses, the, you'll get the vote of a, of, of a white majority on the West Coast in order to support the disenfranchising post-Reconstruction's collapse um, in the South. And in return, you'll get the support. What the hell does James G. Blaine have going for? What, what, you know, if you're, no matter where you're from, so it turns out to be a completely familiar national, regional political calculation, which leads to it. And then it begins to beget the very virulent hatreds it's partly based on. So that, I mean, after passage, the purges across the 1880s and into the 1890s of Chinese across the West is one of the most frightening things that's ever happened in American history, you know, from set from Los Angeles in 1871 to the Snake River in 1887. You know, 300 towns and communities purged entirely their population of Chinese in a lethal, homicidal way. Um, and then the law just gets doubled down on. So it becomes this, it gets knit into the national political culture of how we fear, you know, it had begun nativism in the 1840s, but you know, that nativism rises again and again. And we did not, we were not a nation of immigrants in the sense that we we're fond of them. We were only a nation of immigrants. Um, but that idea that we were, it was something we were invested in positively, is a completely post-Civil, post-Second World War, civil rights Cold War phenomenon. You know, it's, it's, it's John Kennedy in the Senate writing a book called The Nation of Immigrants that comes out in 1956, saying, you know what, it kind of doesn't work in the New World Order where we're trying to spread democratic, you know, commercial values abroad that we have the most exclus exclusive, by then, immigration policy in the world. We gotta ease up on this, and so that leads to, in a funny way, finally the Statue of Liberty stands up and begins to read the words of Emma Lazarus in some ways that resonate, even though that had been written, you know, generations before. But it's really not, the, civil, the Statue of Liberty did not finish being constructed, and this is why we started the film with this, to your filmmaking point. You could really say it was only in 1965 with the passage of the Hart Seller Act and the opening up of the golden of Emma Lazarus's golden door did did Lady Liberty finally kind of stand up and begin to sound like this is who we are as Americans and then we instantly forgot the Chinese Exclusion Act while Chinese themselves um, had triple quadruple reasons to want to leave this behind the paper sun legacy the example of Japanese internment during the Second World War um, all meant that this was history that was fraught 
complicated and maybe radioactive. And you might just have to, might be better off just to let it drop to the bottom of the sea. So, you know, hence the, hence the moment of forgetting um, instead of the moment of memory. For those of us who um, are too impatient to wait until May to watch the PBS broadcast documentary, how can we see the whole thing now? Great. Uh, you know, we will make available to you the whole two hour and 40 minute thing. Anybody who wants to send us their, their um, email, email we'll send you a link. Okay. So if Margaret, if we could do that. Yeah, why don't we set up a sign up list right now? Oh, sorry. Why don't we set up a sign up list by the front door where they checked in? Will that work? Oh, you already have their emails. Oh, so maybe. Um, Yes, send it to everybody. <laughs> yeah. That would be great. <laughs> or We'd love to do that. My o o only thing Leisha and I ask in return is that you watch all two hours and 40 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay, Ava? Hi. Um, I'm so glad that you've done this documentary. Um, and even just in this brief snippet that we've seen, like the first section, I thought you did an amazing job giving us background history um, that is actually quite complicated, right? Um, and so I think you did a really amazing job like distilling it for a general informed audience. Um, the thing, uh, I think for me, like the question that I have is when watching that first section, I found myself feeling like I really wanted to hear the perspective of the Chinese who were being pushed out, right, up and down from, uh, you know, uh, the, what the uh, sorry, Washington territories down through California, right? So the question that I have is, um, did you, uh, was there an effort to try to find um, the perspectives and any documents from folks who were alive at that time? Um, so that's one question. And the second was just, um, I found for myself as a viewer, the moment where the historian uh, K. Scott Wong has that moment where he almost looks like he's about to um, tear up, right? Because he's having this personal moment where he's thinking about his family. For me as a viewer and as a Chinese American viewer, um, it, it, I, I really felt that moment of connection at that point. Um, so, uh, so, so just, take that for what it's worth. Oh, the second question, sorry. Um, you also um, had us uh, an image of Wang Chenfu, and there was another image of the Chinese Equal Rights League. And my question is, how much about Wang Chenfu and the Chinese Equal Rights League um, do you actually get into uh, in the documentary? Um, we, we do have um, wonderful readings um, by Russell Wong um, of three amazing quotes. I mean, the, what I mentioned, um, Norman Asin, his, her, his rebuttal to uh, Governor Bigler. But across the film, we do have, you know, research the, the, the Chinese voices of the time and have actors um, read them. Um, and also there are voices from Angel Island, you know, the poems on the, on the walls. Um, so it's, it's, it's um, we really wanted to tell this um, story of this legislation and, and its impact. So we uh, actually purposely did not sort of um, reach out to families who are, you know, for example, probably your family, who are directly uh, affect, you know, descendants of, of this story. Um, uh, because as you say, it's a very complicated story. And we, we just sort of felt like we wanted to focus on the whys and the reasons and the social, political, economic forces that, you know, allow this act to, to, to pass. Um, what was the second question? I mean, 
All right, right. Well, I'm so sorry. Yeah, one, two, three. Um, we, we do touch on him, but it's, again, one of those things where, you know, you could make a whole film about Wang Ching Fu. Yeah. And so in this sort of already extended two hours and 40 minute version that we have. Which speeds along, actually. We, 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 we touch upon it, but we don't kind of go deep. You know, we had versions that went deep, but then it just you know, in the end, you, you, you couldn't tell the stories we wanted I think to in tell. a way we did, it's not that we didn't want to, yeah. but I think that it's, you know, there's a kind of, the, the rhythm, the DNA of the film involves a kind of interplay of the personal and the national, um, you know, the regional and the national, and which is in a sense what legislation itself is. And this is a film about a law or a series of laws. We really wanted to feel how did this piece of legislation come about, but you know, while we didn't, you know, um, interview the sons and daughters, the descendants of Joseph and Mary Tape, um, you know, Eric, Erica Lee, her great 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 grandfather came over in 1857 and was one of those people who just got off the boat in San Francisco and disappeared into the crowd. Um, Scott Wong. So there was a way in which we came to feel like. There's, a kind, you know, the, the personal in stake kind of slowly builds itself, and it turns out to be some of the people who have just been the historians turn out to be stakeholders, and you kind of discover that. And we didn't blow that early on by, like, so that first it's the facts, and then it's the experience. Yeah, I was going to say, to add to that, a lo you know, many of us have connections to all of the immigration laws. And I think because we are, we really are a country of immigrants, most of us somehow do. So I think that even though it may not have been the exact person, um, people can relate to the stories there. And especially all of the historians, I think, that you've interviewed. Now, we have one more question, and it's uh, over here, Rocky. And then after Rocky's question, I, I want to make sure you guys stay and go upstairs two flights. We have a reception upstairs. Oh, great. Well, I obviously want to just add my voice to thanking uh, the filmmakers. And as uh, Margaret Chin, who we all know has been an advocate and a professor of Asian American studies, it really is true that sometimes it's hard to communicate this story. And I think the film medium is really important. So I guess my question is, um, there are a number of Chinese now in the United States, both immigrants who can, and who have grandparents or parents who can uh, trace their, their history back to what you're talking about. And we have a lot of new Chinese today. So the one question is whether you think there could be some way to utilize this film and maybe even translate it. Uh, because it seems to me, in meeting some of the Chinese immigrants today, they have no idea, absolutely no idea of the history. And they come from different class backgrounds, different experience, and yet they also have been deprived of a certain history. So that's one question. The other really goes back to just the uh, excellent weaving of politics and so forth, which I think is, a, is both quite, quite needed today, uh, but also the, the, the idea of resistance. And I'm wondering if you, you mentioned some of the things, but if you covered um, in New York the whole Geary Act and the whole resistance that a lot of people don't know about, just like they don't know about the Chinese Exclusion Act, but right here in New York, which ultimately led, of course, to the Hong Yuting case, which is a very important case now when we're talking about immigration. Yeah, I mean, to the, Li Shen, why don't you take the first and I'll take the second quickly. Um, the I, yes, we, we are, as we sit here, um, creating subtitles, Chinese subtitles for the film. And into, um, into you know, so it's the, the question was always in traditional Chinese or simplified Chinese. <laughs> so we're doing both. <laughs> so we're going to. Um, Ho hopefully, um, hopefully in a couple weeks it will be done, and and then the hope is as we go around the country showing this, you know, that option will be available. And then to your other point, yeah, I mean we do 1882. The first law is passed. 
It had to be um, re-upped in 1892, it was. Um, you know, the Scott Act, the Geary Act, the kind of 1902-1904 series of legislation, um, which sort of like pinned it down and made it indefinite, and not just sort of a 10-year thing. The resistance to that, the resistance which took the form of, you know, of, you know, newspaper writing and constant barrage of sort of arguing in the press against the injustice of it, um, the political action, the legal action that was taken. So I think, I think, I certainly hope that from the very beginning of the film throughout, you understand that this was an extremely active community, um, which sometimes with, but mainly not with, um, help from Beijing, um, but not entirely not without. Um, we're really saying, you know what, this, this cannot stand. And using, as Li Xin was pointing out so eloquently earlier, using, you know, not just the rhetoric, but the deep, deep sort of spiritual structure of American legal philosophy. Um, so that it sounds like, you know, Norman Ossing sort of sounds like Lincoln sometimes. And so, you know, so, so do so many of the people who, so, who are determined to say, this is what your laws are. So it turns out that the most, some of the most American people in America in the 19th and 20th century came from China, you know, who just happened to have a set of um, determinations and um, abilities and inspiration and motivation to say, wait a second, we're here, we really like this idea of a place that's based on the rule of law. So let me say, we can see these major discrepancies in the way that's being uh, rolled out right now. And let me tell you why and how. Um, and I think that that's been, that is the story of America, the story of people coming from abroad and seeing the possibilities, you know, in a nation of laws, not men and women, um, of how you can um, make that better. Um, and understanding is, what Rencho, you puts it so well, it seems to me at the end of the film, you know, it shows you, Exclusion Act, something could be democratic, it could be legal, at which point every American goes like, there's only one answer, it must be right, if it's democratic and legal. Whoa, it's more complicated than that. So I hope that that spirit of working with what's there under oftentimes extremely terrible conditions and forging something which is ironically better for all Americans. We wouldn't, I mean, that's why I, it is such an inspirational story um, to, to I think all of us who are fortunate enough to sort of be led to it by Louise Mir and all the wonderful historians, but I think anybody who comes to it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.